tonight on Newsnight Scotland. The widely expected decision to scrap the Long Anna carbon, carbon capture project is confirmed. Where does this leave lofty claims of world-leading technologies and big ambitions to stop pumping so much carbon into the atmosphere? And have we fallen out of love with organic? A special report into an industry struggling as households deal with rising living costs. Good evening. The £1 billion pounds available to develop carbon capture technology is still there, insists the United Kingdom government. But there is little doubt that the decision to scrap the flagship project at Long Anak Power Station is a serious and significant blow to delivering on that technology. Much of what is planned for future energy generation that isn't either nuclear or renewable power is largely predicated on making the technology work. And as things stand, that seems as far away now as ever. Laura Bicker spent the day in Fife getting reaction. This power station used to be Scotland's biggest polluter. For the last three years, it's been a front runner in the race for green energy. Until today, when a deal between the government and Scottish power broke down, which led to this question to the Prime Minister. Given the importance of carbon capture and storage, both as a way of helping reduce our carbon emissions and also as an exportable technology to help rebalance the economy. Will the Prime Minister now put his words into action and step in to ensure that the Loganet demonstration project goes ahead? What I can say to the Honourable Gentleman is the funding that we set aside for carbon capture and storage is still there. That funding will be made uh, available. Clearly the Longanet scheme uh, isn't working as the, in the way that they intended, but the money from the government, the support from the government for this vital technology is there. This is the theory on carbon capture. Coal is sent to a power station where it's burned to create energy. The station captures the CO2 and sends it to a pipeline offshore where it's pumped below the sea into a depleted gas or oil field. A layer of rock is added to stop the CO2 heading back into our atmosphere. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in turning on our mobile test unit. The technology was tested on a small scale at Long Annet. They hoped for bigger things, but the stumbling block was money. It really came down to the fact that there were specifics about the uh, Long Gannett plant, its uh, location, uh, how far away it is from uh, the reservoirs where we would be storing uh, the carbon. Uh, all of those issues made it difficult to, to make it add up. The government had set aside £1 billion, but Scottish Power needed more, about another half a billion. The Treasury wasn't convinced. We're very disappointed. I mean, we're immensely proud of the work we've done in the feed study and bringing a first-of-a-kind project to the level of detail we have, but we're obviously disappointed that CCS and this demonstration project can't go ahead here at Long Annet. Scottish Power has spent over £10 million and had over 350 staff working on carbon capture storage here at Long Annet. That information is now shared with energy companies across the UK. But we understand that Scotland might still lead the way in this technology. The next name in the frame is Peter Head. But that hasn't stopped the start of a blame game. A chance to point the finger and ask what went wrong. I've already written to Chris Hume today and uh, I'm sure the Scottish Government will, will be doing the same. We have to fight for this one. It's not something we, we can easily let go. It's a huge economic uh, opportunity for us. And just because it doesn't figure on London's radar, it certainly does for us in Scotland. There is an international race underway to develop CCS. The commercial benefits to the country who comes first could be huge. The loser could be left to beg, borrow and buy the technology. With the loss of the Long Annet contract, the UK has dropped the green energy baton. The question is, who will now pick it up? The Scottish Government Minister for Finance and Sustainable Development, John Swinney, joined me a little earlier. I began by asking him for his reaction to this decision. My reaction is one of profound disappointment at the decision the UK Government has taken today. There has been a tremendous amount of effort and intellect and research invested in developing the Long Annet proposal as far as it has come. And I think for it to have come this far and not to be taken to the next stage of development and to put us in a position where we could properly realise the advantages and the strengths of what is literally 
a world-leading technological opportunity for Scotland uh, is a profound disappointment for the Scottish Government. What's your understanding of what the problem is? Is it simply uh, that the 1.2 or 1.3 billion estimate that Scottish Power has that the Government is not prepared to pay that much? Is it as simple as that? I think it probably is as simple as that, that uh, essentially as Scottish Power and its consortium colleagues have gone through the process of developing this proposal, which has been done very much in consort with uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, uh, they have uh, they've essentially come to the conclusion that the cost will be higher than the £1 billion that the government has been prepared to allocate. And I think what's disappointing about that is that I think the work that has gone in involving the consortium has been uh, very beneficial work that has given us some real advantages in taking forward this technology. And I think bearing in mind the scale of the contribution, for example, of North Sea oil revenues to the UK Treasury, it's just a mighty shame that the UK government hasn't seen fit to use a very small proportion of that to take this project to its next stage. Right, so the official explanations about, oh, the pipelines were too wrong, you, you don't take that seriously? I, I don't think that's really a compelling argument because if, if that was the case then I think that would undermine perhaps some of the reasons that were being advanced for uh, the arguments against Peter Head four years ago for example so I, I, don't, I don't think that is a particularly substantial argument I think it's essentially about the cost and of course the cost factors are being influenced by the electricity market uh, reform that the UK government is presiding over which is creating some substantial uncertainty about the future financial support that would be available for carbon capture technology. And as a consequence, that makes an investment decision by Scottish Power and its consortium partners much more difficult to take in that context. Is there anything that you want to do or can do as a government, apart from expressing general support for this project? I mean, you presumably don't have the kind of money to step in and replace the British government, even if you had the power to do that. Well, over the years, I think the, power, the powers point is a, is, a, is a very material point, Gordon, and that's, uh, that's why the leadership on this issue has rested with the UK government. I'd have to say that in that process, we have given a great deal of support, practical support, to try to advance the arguments and the approaches to... Uh, yes, but carbon. there's nothing more you can do. Well, we, we certainly will. We remain. We we stand ready to do whatever we can do to assist in taking the project further forward. And obviously, uh, Chris Hewn has opened up the prospect of a further opportunity at Peterhead, which is welcome. But of course, Peterhead was badly let down in 2007 by the Labour government, and um, we must make sure that uh, we now concentrate on on uh, securing the opportunity at Peterhead. What we've done over the last few years has been to take a number of very practical steps in the research field and the role of Scottish Enterprise in the Scottish Green Energy Centre to try to uh, marshal the arguments and to do some of the supportive research that would allow carbon uh, capture and storage technology to be taken okay. forward. So we've been very practical in that work with the okay. UK government and right. we stand ready to do that again. Now, uh, presumably, given that this, the development of this technology is on hold, you will now block the planning application to build a coal-fired power station at Hunterston because that was predicated on using this technology, which was, is not going to be available. If you'll forgive me, Gordon, that there's a live planning application underway at the Hunterston uh, station, and it would therefore be inappropriate of me to make any comment on this issue whatsoever. And I'm not saying that to be uh, in any way to avoid your question. I simply have to... Uh, have due regard to my responsibilities as a minister in the Scottish Government not to make any specific comment about that proposal. All right, Luke John Swinney, thanks very much. We'll have to leave it there. Well, following today's announcement by the Energy Secretary, Chris Hewn, we invited him or any other minister in his department to appear in tonight's programme, but they weren't available within us for any representative of the United Kingdom Government. But again, no one was available. Stuart Hazeldean is Professor of Carbon Capture and Storage at the University of Edinburgh, and he joins me now. Um, why do you think this project has collapsed? Is it simply the money? It's basically down to the money, and of course I'm very glad to be available to help try and explain this, uh, because we know from uh, the documentation which is now available that technically this project stacks up, technically the storage site works, the pipeline works, and the capture plant would work. 
and the whole st uh, speaking by Chris Hewn, the Secretary of State for Energy, about the pipeline being too long is total rubbish. It's, uh, it's actually an advantage, it's a positive to use an existing pipeline. The real problem is that this twofold, the problem is that this has been very slow, very complicated. It's gone through uh, three prime ministers, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and now David Cameron, all of whom claim to be enthusiastic about carbon capture and storage, none of whom has been able to deliver it. It's a project which has been extremely complicated and subject to a lot of Byzantine and quite unfair treasury rules and the government has consistently refused to take in on board much of the risk and the risk problem about how much liability people are going to take is one of the key issues. The project... So hang on, just to explain yeah. that, so it's not, it's not just the amount of government subsidy, No. where is the risk then if, if the government's effectively going to pay for okay, it? Okay, there's been a lot of talk about how much this project will cost over the past two or three days and we now know how much this project will cost because we can read the documentation. And to make it, uh, the figures in there are pretty clear that the project would cost £1,050 million, so it's about the sum of money on the table. But then the Treasury adds another £300 million because it says you might uh, go over budget. And it adds another 15% on top of that because it says we don't actually believe you've got your costs accurate. So if I can just illustrate that domestically, I want to make my house more energy efficient. So I've got a thousand pounds. I'll put that on the table. Government comes along and says, actually, we want you to stump up another 500 just in case it goes wrong. We don't think you're actually going to spend that 500, but that's what we're going to call it. So it's not I actually you're going to produce a top hat and a rabbit. Then, no, no, it? but it's not actually a thousand million. It's not actually a thousand million that's on offer. This project now we see has to come in at about 600 or 700 million. And unless the government solves this type of risk sharing approach, it's never going to deliver anything. Right. Now, what about the prospects for Peter Head? I mean, you heard John Swinney referring to that. Um, the obvious point to make about that, and I don't understand the significance of it, but it, it is a gas plant, isn't it? Right, OK, two, thing, two or three things about Peterhead. Firstly, there's been about £40 million spent on doing the work for Longanit on the capture, the pipeline and the storage site. Peterhead would share <coughs> some of the pipeline and share the exact same storage site, so we can use that existing work, so that makes it cheaper and more readily available. Peterhead's also a shorter distance to connect and capture technically on the gas plant is more simple because it's a cleaner uh, flue gas going up the chimney. The significance of gas for the future is that right now, week after week, about half of our electricity in the UK is generated from burning gas. So if we're looking to the future, we have to realise that gas is cleaner than coal, but gas is still a dirty fuel. We have to clean that up. But if Peter you Head's do, the if only you do, gas project on offer at the moment in Europe. But if you develop uh, CCS that works on a gas power plant, have you, by doing that, developed technology that would work on a coal plant? The UK is probably going to move away from coal, that's my prediction, because the uh, electricity market reform, which John Swinney alluded to, is going to place a big tax on carbon dioxide emissions. And of course that's welcome environmentally, but it means that all coal plants become uneconomic. And with the, present, with the rules as they look at the moment, that all of those coal plants will close by 2022. That will leave a giant okay. hole in the UK electricity generation which Fine. will be filled with gas. Now, now this is a question that, not being a government minister, yeah. you can answer. Given what you've just said and given that the CCS technology is not going to be available, does it make any sense to allow this Hunterson plant to go ahead? Well, of course, as John Sweeney said, it's a live planning application, but it makes it very difficult to understand how the economics of that will work if the economics on a coal plant at Longanit don't work. The company developing Hunterston presumably have their own view, but with the increasing tax on carbon dioxide emissions, it's the other three quarters of the plant which gets taxed to death, which is going to be the problem as well as the CCS. So the economics so, so, on the... So, you say the other three quarters because a yeah. quarter of it would have CCS. Sorry, yes, but the point is, if we don't correct. have the CCS yeah. technology, so then that to quarter isn't going to have that. We've got to take a punt on that. That would then become the first one on coal, and that has to be funded somehow. And then we have to gamble that the other three quarters gets cleaned up sometime in the future, if and when CCS works. All right. I, I, briefly, this, is this big enough to actually put at risk both the UK government and the Scottish government's carbon reduction targets? 
Uh, yes, is the short answer. But on the short time scale of 2020, I think what the UK Treasury is fixated on the short term fix. That's why it's paying people lots of money to mow down forests and burn trees. And that's why it's paying vastly over the rate odds for offshore wind power. Carbon capture and storage can be delivered for the same cost as offshore wind. And we'll need that to get to 2025, which we've now signed up to legally, and certainly to get to 2030 with carbon reduction targets. Without CCS, this cannot work. All right, Stuart Hills, thank you very much indeed. Now.